Good morning, church. All right, wow, there's an echo up here. Good morning, I'm so glad to have you. Welcome to St. John Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Davidson, the shepherd here in St. John. And if you're looking for a church home, welcome home. We're excited to have you with us today. And for our online crowd, it's so glad to have you today as part of our worship service. Having said, we have a couple of quick announcements. The first one coming up, it's called The Gamut. And it is a podcast that is going to be coming up soon. We've turned one of our storage spaces downstairs in the office complex into our own little podcasting and recording session. So uh, more information will come as we continue to develop that and get it up and officially launch it. But just so you know, it's coming. And we're very, very excited uh, to move into some of the more digital age stuff here at St. John. Also, VBS will be coming up soon. More information will come. We'll be doing VBS in a box. And the way that works is every family that has children, we're going to put together a big box full of all of the VBS stuff uh, for every day. And then I'll be putting up videos about how to go through that, especially with all this, the ins and outs of of social distancing. So VBS in a box will be coming soon. That being said, we worship a great and amazing God. Let's take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship today. Begin our service this morning in the hymnal in front of you with hymn 700, Love's Divine, All Love's Excelling. Again, that's hymn 700 in the hymnal in front of you.
congregation, please rise. We continue our service now on page 151 in the hymnal in front of you. Again, that's page 151 with divine service setting one. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment of silence for reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Normally now we share the peace, but can we all give each other a high five for the sharing of peace, the old air high five? <laughs> we continue our service now with our intro. It's found in your bulletin insert. Our intro this morning, it comes to us from Psalm 56. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before God in life. When I am afraid, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. In God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before God in the light of life. We continue now with our Kyrie. It's found on page 152 in your hymnal. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We continue now with our hymn of praise. It's found on page 155 in your hymnal. This is the feast. This is the
scripture today as we make our transition to focus in on our text today. You can follow along in your bullet insert. Today we're going to be soaking in the, in the teachings and the words of the parable of the Good Samaritan. This comes from Luke chapter 10. You can follow along, mark it up. If you brought your, bar, your Bible, mark it up. So here we go. The Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to start at verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And he said to him, You have answered this correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Church, let us pray. Blessed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we love the habitation of your house and the place in which your glory dwells. And I thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to bring us together in your house to hear your word. I ask that my words would be yours. That your blessed Holy Spirit would pour out to redeem our lives, to strengthen us through your word and spirit. Heavenly Father, guide us today. Open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you. Break open our heart and hearts to follow you. So we may live in that life and live it to the fullest. Lord, guide us today and allow us to live in the grace of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Get over yourself. It's not about you. Let me say that again, make sure you heard me. Get over yourself. It's not about you. You know, that's one of my, my favorite phrases in an argument. And as a pastor, you know, I, I deal with a lot of counseling. I deal with folks fighting. Folks will come into my office, and it's like listening to two walls scream at each other. And folks will just go at it. And, and as a church, we try to step in, right? We're the voice of reconciliation in a fallen, sinful world. And so we're trying to, to calm everybody down, de-escalate situations, let all the steam out so people can actually talk. But you know how it goes when you're arguing with somebody, right? You ever had one of those just go at it arguments? and the person is yelling at you, and you're yelling at them, is anybody listening? Absolutely not! You're just waiting for the other person to take a breath so that you can already regurgitate that argument you've been rehearsing in your head while they're over there squawking. And it feels like it's two brick walls going, me, 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 And there's nobody listening, there's no movement forward. All it sounds like is a bunch of noise. And as a pastor, so, so, so many times I sit back and go, hmm, is interesting because neither of them are listening to each other we make no progress and reconciliation when this happens but the one phrase that comes out in any argument that will stop this constant yelling and bickering at each other is that phrase would you just get over yourself this isn't about you because all of a sudden what happens is it's like that scooby-doo moment where we all go rut row because those two walls all of a sudden just stop, and what happens is really funny. The eyes, the physical contact completely changes because both people's eyes roll back into their head, and they start to rewind what they just said. You know why? Because they're trying to debate what they just said, how they said it, and did they make it about themselves. And they, all of them, all of a sudden, you just see like it's this weird moment where they, where they both go. And then the next thing is they try to justify what they said. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Or, oh, let me, let me, let me rephrase so you understand. And that's such an arrogant statement, isn't it? Like, maybe you just didn't understand me. Maybe that's the problem. When in reality, they're just not listening to each other. They're coming with preset arguments. And you see, when we come to this text today in Luke's Gospel of the Good Samaritan, we have this lawyer that comes to Jesus, and he's already got a preset argument. He's already going to come to Jesus and try to justify what he does and how he's done it. And what's funny is whenever we hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, here's kind of the basic overcap and the overview. And I'll, This is the easy sermon that I could have preached today. right? There's a man that's on laying on the side of the road, and Jesus tells him, like, listen, um, don't be like a, a dirty priest that walks by, sees the guy, and just leaves him. Don't be like uh, the Levite that's chosen people and just walk past him. Instead, be the good sinner but is saved by grace who goes and lifts up the Samaritan and uh, takes care of him and makes sure that he's taken care of. Easy sermon, done, amen, let's go and, and hit the buffet. That's the easy way. That's not what this text is about. It's very simple and a good lesson at the beginning, but we're interested in spiritual meat and not milk. See, this text is actually about the lawyer. This text is actually about the lawyer and Jesus saying to the lawyer, get over yourself. It's not about you. And we see it so clearly because what does the lawyer do? Look at the text. 
He says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to him and took him to what? To put him to a test. Oh, if you're Jesus, if you're that guy, the one that people think you are the Messiah, if you are him, then I want to put this guy to the test. I want to see if you, what you're made of. I want to see if this is real. I want to see if you're paying attention. Are you picking up what Moses put down all those thousands of years ago? What, what should I do? You can just see Jesus thinking to himself, this is going to be fun. <laughs> This, this, this guy doesn't get it. It's, it's not about him. It's not about who he thinks he is. He's missing how grace works. He's missing how Jesus works. He's missing how God works to bring reconciliation to us. He's missing how to restore this relationship. And so he puts him to the test. Um, so what's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, good. If you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. All right. Well, he's letting the lawyer get out his side of the argument before he's going to give him a nice rebuttal where he says in a very interesting way, lawyer, get over yourself. Good and faithful Jew has worked so hard to get to where you are. Get over yourself. And so often we need to do the same. So he puts it this way. He says, but he desiring to do what? Look at the text. Justify himself. See, the lawyer's already got his argument preset. All right. In order to justify myself, he's ready to go with round two. Even though Jesus has already kind of thrown out a softball, kind of thrown out a lobber to let him hit out of the park, now we're going to get into some teaching. He says to justify himself, and who is my neighbor, oh Jesus? He's trying to justify who he is. He's trying to say, look, I'm better than everyone else. Like, I've already, test, I've already passed your test. I should get eternal life. Look at me. And Jesus is going to flatten it real quick in a very interesting way. And so the way that he does it, and Jesus does this in such a loving way, but you've got to get some of the nuances of how Jesus has kind of a wit, a sense of humor, a way of hitting home in a way that if you're not in that culture, sometimes you miss. So the way that he does this is really interesting. He says, listen, let me teach you a lesson. You ever had one of those moments where somebody that is one of your elders goes, sit down, let's have a conversation. Let's have a come to Jesus meeting. It's time to flatten some things out. He goes, let me teach you a lesson. See, there was this priest that walked by. He saw this man beaten on the road. See, that in and of himself, the lawyer would understand this. Being a Jewish person, he would understand something about the priesthood. Do you know something about the priesthood in that culture? They would have done a lot to get to that point. When he's saying priest, he's saying high priest. He's saying this guy's put in a lot of years, a lot of time, a lot of energy in order to get to a particular status. He's basically saying to the lawyer, you are the priest. Because he's more interested in his status than helping somebody. He knows a lot of book knowledge. Oh, I should help that person. I should love God. I should love the neighbor. But do you think he's doing it? <laughs> Absolutely not. And so when Jesus says, like, okay, priest, you wanted to test me on the law. You wanted to ask about interpretation. Uh, you're the one that's so smart. So please, explain it to me. Because it's not about you, it's the fact that you're missing the brother sitting on the side of the road. You ever met somebody that tries to justify their works? Well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Look at me, I'm in this high position, this high role. And it's those folks that walk around with their nose side so high in the air, you don't know how they don't trip over their feet. Or you talk to somebody, and maybe it's been one of you, where you look down upon someone because of their works. And you don't feel like they live up to a particular standard. We've got a lot, of, a lot of that going on. And sometimes it's even unconscious to us. We just look down and we don't even think like, oh, them. Oh, those people. And you guys know how I feel about that phrase. Those people? You mean the ones Jesus died for? Yeah, those people. Like you? Yeah. Lord knows you're the one with pride. But we look down upon people. We judge people. You see, you can't serve God and judge someone else. It doesn't work that way. Jesus still sits at the right hand of the Father to come to do what? Judge the living and the dead. Not our job. Let me put it this way. Uh, my previous church, I, I was, it was in charge of a worship service, and uh, I had a lot of folks on the fringe that I really, really loved working with. Folks that were new to Jesus. I had some drug addicts. I had some folks that, that didn't have a, a dime, couldn't shake two nickels together. But we had a growing worship service to the point where we were baptizing people like every week. It was crazy. And I was just on this ride going, how is this working? Praise be to God. I don't get it. But then I had a comment that was made to me that will, that will always stick with me. 
There was a pastor. Let me say it again. A pastor, a priest, a lawyer. Put it all in the same bucket because they're all on the same road. He goes, you know, you guys just aren't bringing in enough money. Maybe you need to spend some time with people with more influence. Okay. Let's just throw James 2 out of the Bible where it says that we show no partiality. Have you ever shown partiality to someone? Where you'll clear the space for one person, but you won't for another. You'll clear room for someone of a high position, but not for someone of a low. How many of you ever been to Walmart? Seen that guy on the side of the road? I've said it before. That could be God sending an angel in the, in the form of a human. Hebrews talks about it in order to test you, in order to understand if you are being faithful. And he's saying this about this lawyer. He has had his nose so far in the air, he doesn't know how to walk without tripping over his own feet. He is missing the point. When you love the Lord your God, you love the neighbor as yourself, period. It does not matter what you think. You know, there was a wrestler, he's an actor now, maybe you've heard of him, called The Rock. Have you ever seen him? He's in all the action flicks. He used to have this phrase when he started, he'd ask his opponent in the wrestling ring, so what do you think? And the guy would start talking and he would go, it doesn't matter what you think. And it's one of those things like when we start to judge, Jesus steps in and goes, I don't care what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. Because the only thing that matters is what Jesus says. I don't care what your preconceived notions are. It doesn't matter. I don't care how hard you've worked. I don't care the position you're in. Because you know what? In Jesus' eyes, he sees us all as his children. We have to learn how to look through that lens beyond judgment. Because Lord knows, everybody in this room has been judged at some point. Am I right? Someone has looked at you in an interesting way. And secondly, in our sinful selves, we've always looked at someone else in the same way. Psalm 130, O Lord, if you kept a record of sin, who could stand? So this is one of those moments where Jesus is telling the lawyer and us by proxy, get over yourself. It ain't about you. And you can imagine how this shocks the lawyer down to the soul, down to the bone. Because then he starts to lean on another argument. Not what he's done, but who he thinks he is. Jesus has an answer for that. In his divine nature, he sees what this guy's churning around in his head. He's making it clear for the audience. Then a Levite came by. A little history. A Levite is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was on a very special pedestal. It was one of these folks that you looked at and you went, Wow, look at who they are and what their history are. In some churches, it goes like this. They were a founding member. It doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> it matters what Jesus thinks. It reminds me of that parable of the workers in the vineyard. Remember how that one goes? There are people that have been in church their whole lives, and then they'll come and they'll go, Pastor, you're spending a lot of time with new people. What about me? Don't you know that I've been in the church longer than them? Partiality, we show none of it. And so Jesus, in that parable with the workers in the field, he comes to people at the beginning of the day and he says, listen, if you work all day, I will give you this amount of money. Cool. Workers are like, awesome. Work. They get to work. A couple, other, a couple hours later, he comes and he grabs another group of people. And he says, if you do this amount of work, I will give you the same amount of money. He comes to the next group a few hours later. Same deal. The group that was there first have been putting in more work come to Jesus and say, you're unjust. Why don't we get more than them? And Jesus' response is very clear. Did I break my word with you? Did I, did I, did, did, did I, did I rock you? Who do you think you are? My deal with you is not about what you think. It is about the deal that I've made with you. I will come to all people. The place in which God's glory dwells is how it happens in Jesus' birth. God's glory comes to all of us. And maybe you've been that person where you've looked down on somebody and been like, well, they're a new Christian. They don't know it like I do. Hmm. Maybe in that moment, you need to act like you've been in church that long. Maybe that's our time to build someone else up, 
maybe it's that time where in love our actions speak louder than our words. Because our lineage doesn't matter. The only lineage we should care about is that we are part of the family of God and the family of Jesus. And go, I'm going to be like Jesus to the world by loving my neighbor as myself. Because the lineage doesn't matter. So then, how are we ought to act? And you can see this lawyer really taking it in because the question really is, how do I inherit eternal life? He's saying, look, you've ripped me down on my status, you've ripped me down on my lineage and who I think that I am, and now how am I supposed to inherit eternal life? How is this supposed to work? And then he brings up this topic of a Samaritan. And in that culture, oh my goodness, this lawyer would have been a faithful, intelligent, academic Jew who wanted nothing to do with a Samaritan. Why would Jesus, God made flesh, the one who was supposed to fulfill all things, the Christ, the Messiah, the beginning and the end, the guy, why would he bring up that filthy, disgusting Samaritan? It's interesting about this. A lot of folks take it to mean, well, that's us, right? We're the sinners. Not the case. While that's true, also, Jesus is teaching him that faith and grace and salvation is going to come from outside of you. In essence, what he's telling the lawyer is, you're the man that's dead on the road. And I'm going to come from outside of what you think. I'm going to come in ways that you don't expect. I'm going to send you help and salvation from people you wouldn't even think possible. For example, St. John is sending you an insane preacher right now to tell you <laughs> there are people that are going to come into your life that you are not expecting that is outside of what you would normally do. You ever had those God moments where you didn't expect a voice to come from somewhere else? That's the Holy Spirit lifting you up. More so, Jesus is saying, not only are you dead on the road, but you are being faithful because Jesus said, you will follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. You will know what it's like to be beaten on the side of the road. You will know what it's like to be stricken, uh, bitten, stricken, and afflicted. Sorry, those words always stick together. You will know what it's like to be in Isaiah 53. You will know what it's like to be in Psalm 22. You will know what it's like because when you follow me, it ain't going to be easy. Anybody had a hard week this week? Congratulations. You are a Christian. If you've ever had those moments where you are down and beaten and you don't know how to get up, good. And it's those moments when you feel like you're dead inside. That's when someone comes from outside of yourself to pick you up. It is not about your works, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is but of the grace of God so that no man may boast. You see, God comes in ways we don't understand. It takes us and puts us on a donkey and carries us. You see, God uses that imagery of a donkey so many times to carry the load, to carry our load. And he brings us to this inn, this hospital in that time. Or let me put it in common terms, here, the church, to be healed. And saying, you will be amidst the people who will help you and take care of you, the people you don't expect. Take a second and look around the room. Yes, it's interactive, do it. These are the people in the inn that will take care of you. And if you're not, I'm going to give you the parable again and again and again and again until you do. This is where we find salvation. This is where God's word is preached. If you haven't heard it, hear it today. Jesus has brought you into the inn so that you can be rebuilt. And what I love is this beautiful ending. When he says to him, let them be there until I return. See, Jesus doesn't just leave us sitting here healing and soaking on his words. Instead, Jesus will return. Jesus will come back. Jesus does promise this. See, what Jesus is doing is he's telling this guy, this lawyer who didn't deserve it, look, it's not by your own works, it's by mine through the cross, and guess what? Not only am I going to help you, not only are you going to be picked up, not only are you going to follow me, but now when you're sitting there and you're healing this place where you and I are today, and I'm going to come back. You ask me the question about how to, return, how to, how to inherit eternal life? Real simple. 
Not about what you think. Get over yourself. What's it about? What Jesus thinks. What Jesus says. What's funny is we think that we're good there. Like, okay, good, I'm saved. I got my eternal fire insurance card. I heard the good news. I'm good. No, what does he say at the end? Now you go and do likewise. You see, it's our job to get people into the church. And I'm not saying the singular we here. Pastor, you go do it. You're the pastor. No, it is our job. If we want the church to grow, we have to follow Jesus' command. Because God has called us to this. And if we want to learn what it's like to follow Jesus, because we know what it's like to be beaten down, now it's time for us to step up into the role of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the time of the rebuilding in Christ. That Holy Spirit that guides us, picks us up, and helps us. Now it's our turn to become that person from the outside. So let me ask you today, who's that person that's getting beaten down in your life? No matter where you're at, who is that person that needs to be picked up? And how are you going to carry them into the end? How are you going to bring them in to the spiritual hospital? How are you going to get them in to the word preached? See, this is Jesus' grace given to us. Because if you want to see God, it's found in doing what he commands. May that God of grace continue to strengthen you this week as you look around and you lift others up as he himself did for us on the cross. May that God of glory walk with you now and always. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Congregation, please rise. In the history of the church, we preach, teach, and confess what we believe and defend about Jesus in the words of the Nicene Creed. On page 158 in your hymnal, we boldly confess these words. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten, not made, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, who suffered and was buried.
Guide us to this life in the fullest and allow us to see your hand of salvation and work through all things. For those who are sick, I ask you to bring your hand of healing according to your will. For the doctors and nurses entrusted with their care, I ask that you would bring your hand of wisdom accordingly. For those who lead, Heavenly Father, pour out discernment so they may make God-pleasing decisions. For those who serve, Heavenly Father, allow us to have a servant's heart in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, guide us to do your will. We thank you for the salvation you've earned for us on the cross and in the resurrection. I ask you would guide us now and always. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. When I am a wasteland, you are the water. When I am the winter, you are the fire that burns. When I am a long night, you are the sunrise when i am a desert you are the river that turns to find
Um, office is open from Monday through Friday from 10 until 2. So when it comes to, to, to giving and to offering, I know that's kind of a, a sore subject with some folks, uh, especially in this time when finances are so tight for some folks with work and all the craziness going on. But I want to remind you of Malachi chapter 3, where God says, test me on these things. In this relationship, it's the best 10% of all that we give. And anybody that's ever been in a relationship knows if you don't give your best percentage, Sometimes we just fall short, but God says, I am always faithful. I am always just. And when he trusts us with a little, a lot comes. And sometimes that lot is intangible. Sometimes it's just a gift of strength and faith and tool. So I ask you to continue to be faithful givers in all that you do and all that you say. Not just here in the church, but especially to the neighbor as we love the Lord for God with all of our hearts, souls, and minds. That being said, we um, continue this time service of the sacrament is found on page 160 in your hymnal, and before we get into it, um, today we get an opportunity to receive a very tangible gift of service. If you're asking, where is God in lifting me up? How is this God's house and God's hospital? All the things you talked about. It. Well, now that we get to receive that, this very body and blood, in with and under, something so simple as bread and wine. If you're nervous about coming up, completely understand, uh, but don't hesitate to come up and cross your arms, receive a blessing, uh, because of the rail, and again, all the stuff that's going on, we ask that you continue, and I can't say drive through because folks will think we'll be out in the parking lot, um, but we'll continue to have a regular motion from each side for communion. So that being said, we continue now uh, with our service of the sacrament is found on page 160 in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. dietary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for you have mightily governed and protected your holy church, in which the blessed apostles and evangelists proclaim your divine and saying gospel. Therefore, with heart for the patriarchs and the prophets and apostles and evangelists, and with all of your servants here at St. John and around the world, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Strengthen you that one true faith, renounce the life for last, and his peace, his joy. 
Amen. Amen. Congregation, please rise for the singing of our common doxology. Please be seated for our closing hymn. It's Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. We'll be singing verses 1 through 4. Again, that's Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. We'll be singing verses 1 through 4.